Jai Shri Prabhupada. So here we go. We will start with reading the book called Krishna Consciousness, The Matchless Gift. And here we are on the first page. The first chapter is called Spiritual Knowledge Through Krishna. The aim of this Krishna Consciousness movement is to bring all living entities back to their original consciousness. All living entities within the material world are, to varying degrees, afflicted with a type of madness. This Krishna Consciousness movement aims at curing man of his material disease and re-establishing his original consciousness. In a Bengali poem, a great Vaishnava poet has written, when a man is haunted by ghosts, he can only speak nonsense. Similarly, anyone who is under the influence of material nature should be considered haunted, and whatever he speaks should be considered nonsense. One may be considered a great philosopher or great scientist, but if he is haunted by the ghost of Maya, illusion, whatever he theorizes and whatever he speaks is more or less nonsensical. Today we are given the example of a psychiatrist who, when requested to examine a murderer, proclaimed that since all the patients with whom he had come in contact with were more or less crazy, the court could excuse the murderer on those grounds if so desired. The point is that in the material world it is very difficult to find a sane living entity. The prevailing atmosphere of insanity in this world is all caused by the infection of material consciousness. The purpose of this Hare Krishna movement is to bring man back to his original consciousness, which is Krishna consciousness, clear consciousness. When water falls from the clouds, it is uncontaminated like distilled water, but as soon as it touches the ground, it becomes muddy and discolored. Similarly, we are originally pure spirit soul, part and parcel of Krishna, and therefore our original constitutional position is as pure as God's. In Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says, Mamai vamsho jivaloke eva bhuta sanatana manakshasthani indriyani prakritisthani karshati The living entities in this conditional world are my fragmental parts and they are eternal. But due to conditioned life, they are struggling very hard with the six senses, which include the mind. Bhagavad Gita 15.7 Thus, all living entities are part and parcel of Krishna. By Krishna, it should always be remembered that we are speaking of God, Krishna denoting the all-attractive Supreme Personality of Godhead. As a fragment of gold is qualitatively the same, the same as the gold reservoir, so the minute particles of Krishna's body are therefore qualitatively as good as Krishna. The chemical composition of God's body and the eternal spiritual body of the living entity is the same, spiritual. Thus, originally in our uncontaminated condition, we possessed a form as good as God's. But just as rain falls to the ground, so we come in contact with this material world, which is manipulated by the external material energy of Krishna. When we speak of external energy or material energy, the question may be raised, whose energy, whose nature? Material energy or nature is not active independently. Such a concept is foolish. In Bhagavad Gita it is clearly stated that material nature does not work independently. When a foolish man sees a machine, he may think that it is working automatically, but actually it is not. There's a driver, someone in control, although we sometimes cannot see the controller behind the machine due to our defective vision. There are many electronic mechanisms which work very wonderfully, but behind these intricate systems there is a scientist who pushes the button. This is very simple to understand. Since a machine is matter, it cannot work on its own accord, but must work under spiritual direction. A tape recorder works, but it works according to the plans and under the direction of a living entity, a human being. The machine is complete, but unless it is manipulated by a spirit soul, it cannot work. Similarly, we should understand that this cosmic manifestation, which we call nature, is a great machine. And that behind this machine, there is God. 
Krishna. This is also affirmed in Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says, this material nature is working under my direction, O son of Kunti, producing all the moving and unmoving beings, and by its rule this manifestation is created and annihilated again and again. Bhagavad Gita 9.10 There are two kinds of living entities, the moving such as human beings, animals, insects, and non-moving, such as trees and mountains. Krishna says that material nature, which controls both kinds of entities, is acting under his direction. Thus, behind everything, there is a supreme controller. Modern civilization does not understand this due to lack of knowledge. It is the purpose of the Society for Krishna Consciousness, therefore, to enlighten all people who have been maddened by the influence of the three modes of material nature. In other words, our aim is to awaken mankind to its normal condition. There are many universities, especially in the United States, and many departments of knowledge, but they are not discussing these points. Where is the department for this knowledge that we find given by Sri Krishna in Bhagavad Gita? When I spoke before the students and some faculty members at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the first question raised was, where is the technological department which is investigating the difference between a dead man and a living man? When a man dies, something is lost. Where is the technology to replace it? Why don't scientists try to solve this problem? Because this is a very difficult subject matter they set it aside and busily engage in the technology of eating, sleeping, mating and defending. However, Vedic literatures inform us that this is animal technology. Animals are also trying their best to eat well, to have an enjoyable sex life, to sleep peacefully and to defend themselves. What then is the difference between man's knowledge and animal's knowledge? The fact is that man's knowledge should be developed to explore that difference between a living man and a dead man, a living body and a dead body. That spiritual knowledge was imparted by Krishna to Arjuna in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. Being a friend of Krishna's, Arjuna was a very intelligent man, but his knowledge, as all men's, was limited. Krishna spoke, however, of subject matters which were beyond Arjuna's finite knowledge. These subjects are called adhokshaja because our direct perception by which we acquire material knowledge fails to approach them. For example, we have many powerful microscopes to see what we cannot see with our limited vision. But there is no microscope that can show us the soul within the body. Nevertheless, the soul is there. Bhagavad Gita informs us that in this body there is a proprietor. I am the proprietor and others are the proprietors of their bodies. I say my hand, but not I hand. Since it is my hand, I am different from the hand, being its owner. Similarly, when we speak of my eye, my leg, my this, my that, in the midst of all these objects which belong to me, where am I? The search for the answer to this question is the process of meditation. In real meditation we ask, where am I? What am I? We cannot find the answers to those questions by any material effort. And because of this, all the universities are setting these questions aside. They say, it is too difficult, a subject. Or they brush it aside, it's irrelevant. Thus engineers direct their attention to creating and attempting to perfect the horseless carriage and wingless bird. Formerly horses were drawing carriages and there was no air pollution, but now there are cars and rockets and the scientists are very proud. We have invented horseless carriages and windless birds, they boast. Although they invent imitation wings for the airplane or rocket, 
They cannot invent a soulless body. When they are able to actually do this, they will deserve credit. But such an attempt would necessarily be frustrated. For we know that there is no machine that can work without a spirit soul behind it. Even the most complicated computers need trained man to handle them. Similarly, we should know that this great machine, which is known as the cosmic manifestation, is manipulated by a supreme spirit. That is Krishna. Scientists are searching for the ultimate cause or the ultimate controller of this material universe and are postulating different theories and proposals, but the real means for knowledge is very easy and perfect. We need only hear from the perfect person, Krishna. By accepting the knowledge imparted in Bhagavad Gita, anyone can immediately know that this great cosmic machine of which the earth is a part is working so wonderfully because there is a driver behind it, Krishna. Our process of knowledge is very easy. Krishna's instruction, Bhagavad Gita, is the principal book of knowledge given by the Adi Purusha himself, the supreme primeval person, the supreme personality of Godhead. He is indeed the perfect person. It may be argued that although we have accepted him as a perfect person, there are many others who do that. But one should not think that this acceptance is whimsical. He is accepted as the perfect person on the evidence of many authorities. We do not accept Krishna as perfect simply on the basis of our whims and sentiments. Excuse me. <coughs> Hare Krishna. Uh -huh. No, Krishna is accepted as God by many Vedic authorities, like Vyasadeva, the author of all Vedic literatures. The treasure house of knowledge is contained in the Vedas, and their author, Vyasadeva, accepts Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and Vyasadeva's spiritual master, Narada, also accepts Krishna as such. Narada's spiritual master, Brahma, accepts Krishna not only as the supreme person, but the supreme controller as well. Ishvara Parama Krishna. This is from Brahma Samhita 5.1. The supreme controller is Krishna. There is no one in the creation who can claim that he is not controlled. Everyone, regardless of how important or powerful, has a controller over his head. Krishna, however, has no controller, therefore he is God. He is the controller of everyone, but there is no one superior to him, no one to control him, nor is there anyone equal to him, no one to share his platform of absolute control. This may sound very strange, for there are so many so-called gods nowadays. Indeed, gods have become very cheap, because especially imported from India. <laughs> People in other countries are fortunate that gods are not manufactured there, but in India, gods are manufactured practically every day. We often hear that God is coming to Los Angeles or New York and that people are gathering to receive him, etc. But Krishna is not the type of God manufactured in a mystic factory. No, he was not made God, but he is God. We should know, then, on the basis of authority, that behind this gigantic material nature, the cosmic manifestation, there is God, Krishna, and that he is accepted by all Vedic authorities. Acceptance of authority is not new for us. Everyone accepts authority in some form or another. For education, we go to a teacher or to a school or simply learn from our father and mother. They are all authorities and our nature is to learn from them. In our childhood, we asked, Father, what is this? And father would say, this is a pen, these are spectacles, or this is a table. In this way, from the very beginning of life, a child learns from his mother and father. He learns the names of things and the basic relations of one thing to another by questioning his parents. A good father and mother never cheat when their son inquires from them. They give exact and correct information. Similarly, if we get spiritual information from an authority and if the authority is not a cheater then our knowledge is perfect 
If we accept to reach conclusions by dint of our own speculative powers, however, we are subject to fall into error. The process of induction by which reasoning from particular facts or individual cases one can arrive at a general conclusion is never a perfect process. Because we are limited and our experience is limited, it will always be imperfect. So here we stopped in the beginning of page number 10 and we have a 15 minute podcast concluded. So stay tuned and uh, well actually this matchless gift book is one of my favorite books and uh, by going further you will also see why <laughs> because Srila Prabhupada has this very incredible way of explaining such high subject matters in such simple words so relatable and just straight to the heart so thank you for listening and uh, we'll see you tomorrow Hare Krishna